It's time to set aside the superficial. It's time to go deeper. It's time to engage in truth. Here's John Bornstein. Well, everybody, welcome back to Engage in Truth. This is John Bornchain. I'm a senior pastor of Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley Church right here in Colorado Springs. I'm thrilled that you're tuning in today. This is our continuation of our study of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. That's right. If you tuned in last week, you know that despite what was going on in Afghanistan, and we spent a great deal of time talking about that, praying over what was happening in that country and continues to happen as you listen to this broadcast right now, our hearts are grieved over that situation. So we did spend some time talking about the Middle East and what was happening in the Middle East as it relates with biblical prophecy, how we are to look to these things, not to be dismayed, but rather encouraged that when Scripture gives us clarity on these situations, we know that there is a plan that cannot be thwarted. Jesus Christ is coming again soon. That's where we put our hope in and know that to be true, that he is coming to reign. And we, the bride of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, our Lord, must be ready for his coming reign. It's not an if, but when. And so we look to these signs knowing that Jesus Christ has already told us that this would happen. And now as we put our eyes on the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, our hope in this is to encourage you further that not only is Jesus Christ coming, but when he comes, he will establish his throne, his kingdom, he will reign over all the earth, and he will do so for a thousand years And then there will be a new heaven and a new earth. We'll get into the new Jerusalem then at that point, talking about what happens at the end of that thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. So to help me here in the studio get into this very powerful discussion of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, here with me, Dr. Steve Ford. Dr. Ford, welcome back to Engage in Truth, my friend. Thank you, John. All that, it was so hard for me not to woo-hoo when you're talking about <laughs> Jesus coming back and reigning for a thousand years. Amen. Yeah, our hearts just leap with joy. Think about the opportunity to spend that time with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and our fellow believers, our brothers and right. sisters in Christ. It's going to be an amazing time and something for us to look forward to. And I think we'll see that as we continue with this study. Amen. So one of the questions I had ab- about the millennium is there seem to be some different views about the millennium itself. Can you clarify some of those for us exactly what the different positions are? And and I'm glad you asked because it's important that we just clear that up of what we're, what we're going to do here over these next few weeks, because we know that this study of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ is not something we can cover quickly. Uh, Even last week, I think we just scratched the surface. We covered a couple questions and and to our listener, if you missed last week, you can go to Calvary Fountain dot com listen to the program there again and again share it with your friends and family alike get the word out because we need you to know the truth of god's holy word that's why this program is called engage in truth and so we examine just in brief about the end of really the seven-year period of time called the tribulation or the great tribulation and it ends with this battle we know to be called armageddon this this meeting of nations at megiddo it's a 200 mile long battlefield all across Israel as all these nations converge against Israel and ultimately against Jesus Christ. And we see that a glimpse of what may be taking place even now in the preparation of this, where we see these nations come against Israel in Psalm 83, and then we see Ezekiel, Ezekiel 38 and 39, which really captures the battle of Armageddon. And, you know, what we see in the book of Revelation of these this four and a half foot height of bodies and, uh, you know, Ezekiel 39 covers, it'll take seven months to clean up afterwards. And so we hit this, okay, there, the battles now happened. Zechariah tells us that those who stand against the Lord there in Jerusalem will dissolve as they stand. The Lord Jesus comes victoriously into Jerusalem after descending to the Mount of Olives, cracks it in two, he comes into Jerusalem, he begins to reign. And so what we want to cover through this study is what happens with the believers and, yes, even the unbelievers. There will still be unbelievers on the earth. What happens to them? Uh, What does God do in appointing cities and jurisdictional authorities and having his royal priesthood reign at his side? What does worship look like there in his new temple, this 56-square-mile district that's dedicated to worship of him in this 562,000 square foot temple that he reigns from. And so we have so many things to explore as we study this uh, this period of time, this significant period of time of the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Well, what we have going on today are a number of viewpoints that I believe are the cause and effect, if you will, 
The effect being that people are growing impatient. And so, or I should say that's the cause, rather they're growing impatient. And so the effect being is that they have a different perspective of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So as they're growing impatient, wondering, okay, where is Jesus? Have we perhaps gotten the millennial reign wrong? Maybe it's spiritual. Maybe it's happening in the heavenlies and not a physical thing on the earth. So let's look at that just in brief. Uh, These various views can lead to a lot of confusion because Revelation was not written in Latin originally. Okay, that so the term millennium is a Latin word. Uh, what we see in the Greek is is different, but yet expresses the same period of time. This chiliasm or chilioi, and it's a Greek terminology for the same that means a thousand year period of time. Now, other views that have come on the scene, such as the pre millennial view, which is one that I hold to. We believe that Christ will personally return and reign on the earth for a 1,000-year period of time. And this premillennial view, then, is the result of a literal interpretation. For me, that is the safest view. And so as we read Revelation chapter 20, we read it through the lens that says we may not fully understand it. It may be bigger than we could possibly imagine or get our arms or minds around and our finite understanding of things, but we believe it to be a literal interpretation. That's the safest. It keeps the imaginations of men under control. And the ancient church, down to the time of Augustine, and we see from 354, 430 AD time frame, with some minor variations in there, unquestionably, they held to that pre-millennial view that Jesus Christ was going to literally reign for a thousand years. Then you have some other views that started to creep in, such as the post millennial view. It expresses the view that Christ returns after the millennium, that somehow the millennium may even be going on right now, and that this would occur at the end of that period of time. And we see all kinds of contradictions to that from Matthew chapter 24, 2 Timothy 3, 2 Thessalonians 2. It was this Unitarian that seemed to come up with this idea, and his name is Daniel Whitby, around 1628-1725 in that region. So, you know, well past a thousand years later did these ideas start to come up. One Another view that comes up is the amillennial view, and it denies the literal reign of Christ on earth, that somehow Satan in all of this is bound at the first coming of Christ, and such, such then the present age between that first coming and the second coming of Christ is then seen as the fulfillment of that millennium. So uh, people believe that somehow the millennium then is being fulfilled in you, in the church age, and as he is gathering his redeemed people, this then becomes the millennium as they view it. And and all it is is the equivalent of, of God and his kingdom inside of you or some spiritual analogy of it. And I believe, again, that this was the cause and effect from 2 Peter 3, 4 to 8, who told us that people would grow impatient, looking for the return of Christ, going, okay, where is he already? You've been talking about him. Where is he? Is he Has he come yet? And so they have to create some sort of new perspective because that, that must be it. Maybe we just missed it altogether. But I think that the safest place for us to be is to examine it historically, examine it scientifically, literally, looking through the lens of literal interpretation of God's holy word. Because, Dr. Ford, you and I were talking before the program, and we said, well, let's look at Egypt, for an example. How about Sodom and Gomorrah or Tyre or any other place where God executed judgment on a nation that ultimately give us a purview, a preview, if you will, of what would happen globally, certainly what happened in Egypt, those were not allegorical or symbolic judgments from a standpoint of being over-spiritualized or some sort of a sensationalized, but rather they were literal judgments that came. God executed judgment on Egypt, and all of the nations around it saw it, were scared of the God of Israel right. as a result of it. And that, give us, that gives us an image of what he would do ultimately globally. So if it was that real then, it will be that real later of the judgment portion. Therefore, Christ's reign also should be literal. So to me, that's where we're going to land in this as we talk about the millennial reign of Christ. Let's look at it through the lens of what does the Bible actually say and, and why we believe it to be a thousand year period of time. So it is a literal thousand years then. Yeah, I think uh, let's, let, yeah, that's a great point. Um, I throw that out almost as if that's sort of like just second nature. For some people, they may be hearing that for the first time going, wait a minute, you're talking about an actual thousand 1, year thousand period years. of time. 
It is. I, I believe that this is what we're going to examine here. The millennial reign of Christ is a thousand-year period of time. So as we look in Revelation chapter 20, verses 2 to 7, the term thousand years is used six times. So it's a, a definitive timetable. It, it, there's no question about this. Of these events, it relates to a thousand years. So to me, the safest in biblical interpretation is when the plain sense makes good sense, seek no other sense, <laughs> right? I mean, that's the simplest way to look at this. And I believe there's four good reasons to this as to why Jesus Christ's reign will be a physical earthly reign rather than a spiritual heavenly one, okay? So number one, Christ will be on the earth after he returns, okay? Let's we see that scripturally. Revelation 19, 11 to 16 makes that promise, that declaration. He will be on the earth. He's not going to Jupiter, not going right. to Mars. He comes to the earth. Secondly, God promised the saints an earthly reign in Revelation chapter 5, verse 10. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Thirdly, at the end of his reign, the saints who reign with him will still be on the earth in Revelation 20, verse 9. And fourthly, the Old Testament messianic prophecies, they anticipated an earthly kingdom. Remember, they got it wrong when Jesus came the first right. time. They thought he was coming to liberate them from Rome, from all the oppression they were going through, seeking this glorified Messiah who was going to reign on high, reestablish Israel, Israel, and punish all of their enemies. Well, what they didn't understand was the first and then the second coming right. and the missing of the church age in between all of that. And I think that then we have to ask the question, why? Why a thousand year reign, right. right? I mean, if it is a literal thousand years, right. why? Yeah, why not 500? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, let's just throw out a number. I mean, right. it, um, I, and I love that numerology in scripture makes sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Bible's numbers always make sense. God is the author of math. He's the author of language. Right. He knows exactly what he's talking about. If we can't trust three days and three nights, mm -hmm. How can we trust that the Lord actually resurrected his three days and three nights, that that period of time was designated, set forth before time began, and indeed he resurrected as he had declared? Um, can we trust then that he created in six days? If not, why not six million years and so forth? I believe that the God we worship is atemporal. He's outside of time. He rules time, not time ruling him. He's not subject to time. Then time would be superior to God, and we know that's not true. So in our understanding scripturally, God could have chosen to make it all in one second if he wanted to. He right. chose six days for a reason. Everything has a reason. So I find it interesting that the temple era, the first two temples, we look at that. Temples are interesting because the temples of God— Give us the stone, the standing stone markers of time in which you can measure all the durations of time scripturally by the temples, okay? And the co combination of the first two temples, the first and second, second was modified by Herod later, uh, we see that that duration of time was about a thousand years when you add it all together. And, and it, we say about because it's difficult to measure something that was 1000 BC, uh, and here we are 3,000 years later, can we measure it with absolute precision? But during the reign of Christ, the third temple revealed in Ezekiel, which is Ezekiel 40 to 44, will stand for 1,000 years. So I believe all of this was determined at the beginning. I mean, Isaiah 46.10 tells us that God saw the end from the beginning. He established the seven-day creation period time, according to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and he chose to rest on the seventh day, not because he was tired, but because he blessed it, sanctified it, set it apart for a reason. And the seventh day would become the holy day of the week during which the people were commanded to worship God, to be in his presence, to worship him, just as Adam walked the cool of the day with God Almighty as he walked the cool of the day. That was the first temple, was to be in the presence of God. Adam was a caretaker of God's temple there to have communion and fellowship with God. And we see that in Exodus 20, 8 to 11, Leviticus 25, and Isaiah 58. So many believe that the six-day creation aligns with the earth's duration of time with the kingdoms of men. So ending with the seventh day, so that there would be 6,000 years and a 1,000-year Sabbath. Remember, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Everything would culminate with him, a 1,000-year reign or a 1,000-year Sabbath of the, Lord, of the Lord. And we get that from Matthew chapter 12, 1 to 8, Mark 2, and Luke 6. So this followed by the last great day. If you look at the Feast of Tabernacles, it was a one-week period of time. 
And there's this other feast that's kind of hooked onto the end of it. It's called the eighth day, the final day, the great day. It's a great day of the Lord, and it seems to symbolize when all things will be made new in Revelation chapter 21. So a week seems to be the appointed time by God, and that's also highlighted in Hebrews 4. We read in Psalm 90 verse 4 and 2 Peter 3, 8, he tells us this little wonderful mystery that we can just skip right over, but the day is but a thousand years and a thousand years is but a day. So when God instructed Israel to keep the Sabbath day holy, there was an honoring weekly of the observance of ultimately the reign of Jesus Christ. It was to prepare them for the presence of God, God with his people, ultimately setting up the plan that there would be no longer a chasm between those of sin and he of perfection, but rather through Jesus Christ, that bridge would be made and he would be with his people forever and ever once again. We see that in Revelation 20 to 22 in Hebrews 4. So the bottom line, we're going to need a thousand year Sabbath to prepare all the overcomers to walk with God forever. I mean, at the end of the thousand year period, there'll be a final purging of those who do not follow Jesus Christ. We'll talk about that, of why Satan is released after that thousand year period of time. And it breaks our heart to read that in Revelation 20, verse 8, they'll have so many after that thousand year period that will turn against Jesus. We'll look to that. We'll study that very closely. But when we read in Revelation 21, 3, that God the Father will be with the people and walk with them, it's an image of what we had in the Garden of Eden all over again, right? It's bookended with this. Begins with the tree of life, ends with the tree of life. But there's no tree of knowledge of good and evil anymore. So a perfect capstone of all of it coming full circle to what it was planned to be at the very beginning. So the big question, here's a big question. If we indeed look to this as saying that it was a 6,000-year plan before the 1,000-year Sabbath, if that's accurate, then how long do we have before the return yeah, of Jesus, right? That's always the big one. That's what we're going to And we've got to be very <laughs> cautious in this because, you know, no man is will know the day or the that's hour. Right. Only God that's knows correct. this. Jesus deflected to that. Only the Father knows. We've seen plenty of billboards, read plenty of books, everybody trying to guess a time. For me, it's simple where I just read scripture. And one of the things I did in school was I thought, you know what, I want to know how many years have gone by in the scripture. I don't want to take somebody's word for it. I'm just going to add it all up myself because the Bible gives us all of these durations of time. So we can go all the way back to Adam and we count 5,915 years. That's it. All the way back to Adam. And you say, well, what year was it? Well, the only markers in time that we might have a year for was the first temple and the second temple. And then we get all the durations of time in between. So if we know the date of the first temple, you can go all the way back to Adam because the Bible tells us that so-and-so begot so-and-so, so-and-so begot so-and-so, and and how many years between all those? You simply add it up. That's what I did. And and so what we find in that is, well, the devil's very clever. He's a master deceiver. And let's not undermine that at all. He was able to deceive a third of the angels in heaven. He knows what he's doing to try to deceive. But in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, he makes attempts to change the times and the seasons. So what happened is we saw that a transition in the Gregorian calendar, even under Caesar, we moved away from a 360 calendar to a 365-day calendar. That five-day variance began officially around 45 BC. It was called the Julian calendar, later modified to become the Gregorian calendar in 1582 under Pope Gregory. And it would suggest that the Bible then is ahead of our modern calendar by 29 years. So that means we'd be looking at the year 5,944 according to the biblical timeline, which means you do the math if we've got 6,000 years, you've got 56 years left before the return of Christ if it's a 6,000 year marker. But, okay, yeah. Yeah, I hope I, let a me make that in a capital <laughs> but. Okay, we didn't account in that for all the leap years nor all the other calendar variances. We also have a conflict with the Hebrew calendar. They believe that puts us around 5,778. So either way, they're still operating with the idea of the 6,000 year. But let me throw another challenge, okay? It doesn't, there's so many challenges. There's a reason for this. But if you go to Genesis chapter 5, 1 to 3, it says, this is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created the male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. 
Okay, The Bible doesn't give us a date, but rather gives us a duration of time. Adam lived 130 years and begot Seth. This is after Cain and Abel. And then he lived another 800 years, according to Genesis 5-4, for a long old life of 930 years. Of course, wow. Methuselah beat him. But we get that number from Genesis 5-5. So during which he has many other sons and daughters. So from that point forward, we can track to Noah and beyond. So here's the big question. How long did the earth exist before Adam and Eve sinned? Okay, now according to the book of Jubilees, it was seven years that they were in the garden. Some of us speculate it was only a few weeks. Could have been only a few days before they sinned. So we're told that Adam lived 130 years before Eve bore Seth. Was the time counter active in the perfect garden when man didn't age nor sin? Okay, so we're told that God drove them from the garden and placed cherubim at the entrance to guard it lest they eat of the tree of life and live forever, according to Genesis 3, to 24. So the human age was clearly not a factor until they could no longer eat of the tree of life. Therefore, we can't so easily come to the conclusion that he was only 130 years of age when he begot Seth. It was 130 years later, once they began to age. Now, we don't know. I mean, maybe that's exactly the counter. The moment God breathed breath into Adam, he began to be tracked in how old he was, even before he began to age. Okay, that's a possibility. All of this creates a dilemma when tracking the coming of the Lord, and rightfully so. He told us in Matthew 24, 36, I just alluded to it, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. I mean, Christ would reiterate this point in Matthew 25. He says in Matthew 25, 13, Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So if the theory of days from the creation are aligning with the timeline of the earth when all things will be made new, according to Revelation 21 to 22, here's one thing we can know for certain. Christ is coming soon, right? I mean, if we take all the math out of the into the equation here and, and you're drilling it down, it could be just a few years away. It could be 30 years away. It could be longer. Maybe we've got the math wrong entirely. I'm just telling you from what you can count in the durations of scripture, we are coming very close to that 6,000 year number, which many messianic Jews, rabbis alike believe was the designated period of time with a 1,000 year Sabbath. So the age of man isn't all that old after all. Christ is coming soon. We're seeing the signs unfold. Could be tomorrow. Could be years from now. Either way, we have to live as the bride of Christ that's ready. And he tells us to have our lanterns full, oil filled, ready for his coming, knowing that he's coming, looking to these signs and going, wow, look what's happening globally right now. Look what's happening in Turkey. Look what's happening in the Middle East. Look how it's surrounding Israel and preparing for battle against Israel and how her allies are abandoning her. Look how this is all unfolding according to Daniel chapter 11. We're not dismayed, but going wow, Christ is coming soon and we're not making that up. It really is coming soon. How do we then live with that in focus? And I think that's our heart in this show is that we not scare anybody, but rather help them put their eyes on the factual reality that Jesus is coming soon. And I know our hearts have been, for those who are listening, do they even know Jesus? Because everything we're talking about could be just completely going over their head. Do they really know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, so that they're not left behind in this, but they're looking eagerly to his coming reign and that, that wedding feast with the Lamb, they're invited. Yeah. And so, Dr. Ford, share with our listener just your heart that they would know Jesus Christ. Oh, it's, it's so hard to put into words. Uh, a God who came and, and became part of his own creation to live and suffer and die, uh, he really suffered for us and as us on the cross, mm-hmm. suffered the, the death that that we really should have died, lived the life that we really should have lived. And there's, there's a hope, there's a love, there's a savior with open arms waiting today, calling to you, wanting relationship with you. And there is nothing like being in relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm. So as, as John has, has been speaking, if the Holy Spirit has prompted you to accept Jesus Christ as your savior today, will you follow with us in this prayer? Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I have sinned. I have followed my own way instead of yours. I ask for your forgiveness. 
I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior all the days of my life. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. And if you have prayed that prayer and and you want to know what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, then you're going to need some training, some equipping, some iron sharpening iron. Please come and check us out at Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley Church. You can learn more at calvaryfountain.com. Services are 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. on Sunday, and we'd love to see you there. God bless you, my friends.